Hello, Audrey. Hi, good local time, everyone. Hello, so uh, I'm happy to see you, and also Japanese audience are also happy to see you. And welcome to our innovation garden, Audrey. So today uh, we're going to do the interview with you um, uh, for uh, for about uh, many kind of themes. So uh, as for a quick introduction, um, uh, let me uh, let me speak uh, a little bit for this session. So. Um, Today, um, I would like to call you Audrey uh, with uh, dear feelings. And I'm very happy to see you and uh, thank you to be here to accept our proposal uh, of interview. So um, you are now one of the most famous person in Japan right now, uh, especially through your work against COVID-19 in Taiwan. And but uh, most of us uh, don't know very much about your deep thought and deep vision or deep philosophy. So today I would like to ask you uh, many questions directly and personally and very with ease. And I would pick up many kinds of questions from Japanese audience, um, audience of viewers to realize true remote dialogue. So and I would like to uh, make the dialogue uh, something near to transparent one. So uh, you love this word, I think. And no barriers, no borders, no rules. So and uh, let, let me uh, speak a little bit in Japanese to Japanese audience. Okay. Mm. えっと、日本の皆さん、え、本日オードリー・タンさんが、えっと、イノベーションガーデンに来てくれました。えっと、直接ですね、話す機会、ま、今、あの、最もえ、有名な人の一人だと思いますが、えっと、なかなかない機会
the situation uh, also situation on Taiwan because um, today uh, we see many kinds of division and uh, take takes place uh, because um, uh, for example division of country or division of society uh, especially in US etc so um covid-19 brought us not just international solidarity and but also such kind of division uh, and up other negative effects so how we can uh, avoid uh, that kind of negative effect so um and also uh, we think uh, one of the keys is humor, humor, uh, because uh, in the COVID-19 situation in Taiwan, you, uh, I think you uh, did uh, many kinds of action with humor. So um, please uh, let us uh, know uh, about uh, your thoughts about it. Yeah, I mean, who will be against a cute dog? Uh, and. <laughs> That's the spokes dog or Zongchai, a Shiba Inu uh, of our Central Epidemic Command Center. And the Shiba Inu is reminding you, like right now, when you're indoor, please keep three Shiba Inu away from one another. If you're outdoor, please keep two. Mm -hmm. And also wear a mask. But why would you wear a mask? Because as I said, it protects you from your own unwashed hands. Uh, when I say it, maybe some people listen, but people will not share it. So, However, when the cute dog says it, everybody shares it. It becomes an idea worth spreading. An idea worth spreading is an innovation. So this is how we make sure that a social innovation reaches more people who laugh about, of course, the cute dog, you just laughed too. Uh, and once you laughed about it, it's literally impossible for you to feel outrage against physical distancing rules. So because these two pathways in the mind, rage can turn to joy, but joy does not go back to rage. That's the idea, the central idea of humor over rumor. So that kind of um, idea, innovative idea, uh, using the humor uh, to um, to to reach uh, really to the people, uh, is that an idea born from you or from other uh, people? Uh, it, is is it uh, the kind of um, Taiwan's? Um, so is it very Taiwanese idea or what do you think about it? Yes, uh, we call it the Taiwan model. Just as we fight the pandemic with no lockdown, we fight the infodemic, that's to say the disinformation crisis with no takedown. And I shared very early on in 2017 in our cabinet meeting for truth to spread faster than rumors, it need to be structured it need to be open and it need to be fast. That is to say, if the clarification after each trending rumor is spread within 60 minutes, then even though it starts later than the rumor, it catches up having a higher basic transmission rate or the R value, because the R value of joy is higher than that of anger. But if you publish this like a press release a day after, then people have already went to sleep with the outrage. Mm. And sleep, as you know, form long-term associations. And that will actually create a long-term association to the feeling of outrage. And so the next day, even though it may be really good press release or clarification, it will not work anymore. It will just reinforce the bias. So 60 minutes at longest two hours, that's very important. But I cannot take credit for actually making such comedies. This is the credit is entirely in the media and participation offices in each ministry and also our premier, our head of the cabinet who have cleared his image for a lot of the humorous responses 
like this one, which was before the pandemic, that says, oh, are you going to find people for $1 million for perming their hair multiple times a week? And then he posted his younger photo saying, I may be bald now, but I will not publish punish people who look like my youth. And say, what we have done is a labeling requirement. And although it will not damage your bank account, if you perm your hair many times a week, it will damage your hair. Just look at the premiere for what will happen to your hair. Uh, and of course, this is making fun of himself, uh, a very good natured humor. And this spread much more fast than the disinformation. So this is, I think, a all of government approach. And while I have spread the idea, the actual memes are done by professionals. Yeah, I think uh, that kind of action is very particular in Taiwan and in the in the age of COVID-19 because I can't see any kinds of such action in other countries, but in Taiwan. So, um, so, but um, why? Uh, what, do you think why uh, the um, the humor can overwhelm uh, the anger? Well, psychologically. It's very simple because when anger travels on social media, sometimes it seeks revenge. Sometimes it seeks uh, what we call othering, which is to lower the status of people who are not like us. So it is the core of division. It's the othering, blaming the disease or blaming the infodemic on people who look different from us, believe in different religions, belong to different ethnicities, and so on. And so while this kind of outrage can hurt the society, if we ask a very simple question, how can we prevent something that's this outrageous from happening again? Then that channels the energy into co-creation. So you can see the funny pictures that we roll out all contain the scientific fact or the legal fact or some sort of evidence that shows the things that you're worrying about, it will not happen again. And that channels people's energy toward joy. And this is a one-way street. It does not go back. So clear. Thank you. And I, I also uh, want to hear you about the, um, this kind of remote, remote experience, because um, uh, today we are now doing uh, this kind of remote interview, so naturally. So um, we get used to this technology gradually, I think. And Audrey, you are, I think, one of the pioneers of this kind of uh, remote technology because you did some VR meetings with children by using other avatar before this uh, today's COVID situation. So um, what do you think about this kind of coexisting experience? So mm -hmm. what is the true potential of this remote technology? Oh, you have Oculus Glass. Yes. Um, uh, my point uh, about co-presence is not about replacing the act of actually sharing the same space. Rather, it is about amplifying the idea of listening deeply one to another, but scale it so it works across space differences and also time differences. While the time zone difference between you and I is small, you're just one hour in the future, yes. there are many places on Earth that are in very different time zones. And when we make a meeting, for example, over um, this telepresence um, screen, we immediately feel we're in different places because we cannot talk about weather. Uh, I can say, <laughs> you know, um, uh, good morning, and for the other side of the earth, they're going to bed. Uh, I can say, you know, it feels very warm and while they are actually in the deep winter. Uh, and so something that is visceral about people-to-people -people interaction is lost when you connect people only through 
the two-dimensional glass. So one of the main point of a co-presence, even just spending time in virtual reality in a shared way, a shared reality for just five minutes, is very, very useful to re-establish what we call rapport. That is to say, a psychological supporting relationship but of course, it doesn't need to be VR. We can also pre-agree to drink the same tea or to listen to the same music uh, or to share the same slice of pizza and so on. But the point is that we need to settle our mind and body into a shared experience before the knowledge exchange. Uh, but I think we don't have that much a problem here because we're just one hour apart. Yeah, between you and me. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so with this kind of um, remote one or shared reality technology, um, how can our communication change in our future? What, uh, mm -hmm. what's your opinion about it? Mm -hmm. I think there are two kinds of changes, and that's across space and across time. Previously when we want to have this kind of almost immediate telepresence, like when you're nodding, I know you're nodding, the latency is very low. Both of us need essentially to be in buildings or in a place with good Wi-Fi reception from a building because previously 4G uh, technology does not have this low latency. So it has to be fiber optics or at most some Wi-Fi and I'm not sure about the Wi-Fi. I'm connecting through Ethernet right now. However, with 5G technology, even in outdoor spaces, even in the mountains or near the shores, you can share your surroundings with me in almost real time. And even music players can jam their music together, even if they are in different outdoor spaces. So that opens up our immediate environment to the outdoors. And that is what 5G brings us. I've been using 5G for many months now. It's truly liberating. My other uh, VR headset, the XR space, has built in 5G uh, antenna. Uh, and so I bring it with me all the time to outdoor places. The other thing is across time, because when we are having this conversation, we're also taking like real-time input from the audience. They may actually join in the middle of the conversation. And if it's a real-time face-to-face conference, people who join in the middle of a conversation probably will not raise their hand and ask a question. But because this is across the screens and people can uh, go back and replace certain elements or to see the captions and so on, it allows people to get back to the context within a short time frame and ask relevant questions. So it compresses time. And if I speak too fast, well, you can replay me many times and ask me questions afterwards. So it makes each meeting a logical continuation of another one expanding its reach to more people. So that's another change. We're much more closer to strangers now. Yeah, your vision is very um, interesting for us. So, um, and another question about uh, about innovation, uh, because uh, our even title is uh, Innovation Garden, and whose um, objective is to uh, realize or uh, to realize uh, Japanese innovation and get it to the world. So um, from, uh, from this part, uh, I would like to talk about uh, three innovations like um, community innovation and open innovation and social innovation. So first, um, uh, we want to talk about um, community innovation because um, you may uh, think the role of community is very important for innovation because 
you say, uh, when, when we see the machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. And so you've, you've also uh, experienced many hacker communities and maybe affected by uh, that, that kind of experience. So please let us know what you've learned from that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I have published a article many years ago with the title Lessons Learned from Open Source Communities. Uh, and I think the main thing that I learned from the open source community is the idea of optimizing for fun. Optimizing for fun may seem counterintuitive because people join community ostensibly not to have fun, but rather to make things together. Because what you see is what you get. What you make is what you learn, right? But having fun is actually very important because without fun, all the motivation is extrinsic. Meaning that if we make things and it doesn't work, we feel a frustration. If we make things and then it doesn't spread, we feel frustration. So if you put your motivation to things beyond yourself, beyond your community's control, then chances are you will burn out because innovations take a while to take root. And it take a while from grassroots to spread like dandelions. Uh, and so the way to keep motivated throughout a long time the secret of that community is to enjoy the process, is to have fun. And this intrinsic motivation of curiosity, of enjoying the solidarity, and also to create something of common value, even though the world does not know it yet. That is like the pleasure, the fun, the joy of creation. And that sustains people over a very long time. And so I think fun is what ties community together. What kind of fun did you get from your past experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think there's many kinds of fun. Some people find that having a stable support of people who celebrate your failure if you share it publicly, that's a lot of fun. A safe space when you can say and share the most crazy ideas and other people say, oh, I see something feasible in it. That's a lot of fun. Unconstrained activities is fun too. In the internet, we say, you ask not for permission, but for forgiveness. That means that when you innovate, you don't have to ask the people who already innovated before you. The World Wide Web did not ask permission from FTP. The uh, BitTorrent does not ask for permission from the World Wide Web. I'm sure that the Bitcoin didn't ask anyone's permission, and Ethereum did not ask Bitcoin's permission either. Yeah. Uh, and so that is a lot of fun. Yeah, I think your uh, philosophy of um, openness and transparency is also very um, um, mm -hmm. driven uh, from that kind of experience. Yes. Mm. So, um, so I, I would like to ask you uh, another question about community because you've uh, talked about a lot uh, uh, about a lot about um, co-creation. So, in, in community, so uh, what is uh, what is the role of the kind of co-creation for innovation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there are innovation that appear in almost a perfect form and only to be replicated. And those are more like industrial innovations, the kind you see on the patent registry. On the other hand, there are open innovations that appear in a very fragile form, like the initial Wikipedia article. It is actually not very possible, not very plausible, when the people see the first few pages of Wikipedia that it will even get anywhere. So the improbability of its success is what draws people to it. 
there is a saying I often quote from Leonard Cohen: "There is a crack in everything, and that is how the light gets in." So open innovation is like opening up a crack, saying, "Oh, I don't know how to make this work. Please help me." And then people came and formed a community together. The best open innovations are like that. If you don't like a Wikipedia article, you are invited to click edit. Yeah, so uh, I'm very uh, interested in your、uh, opinion about that kind of open innovation、uh, because、uh, the next topic is about that. So、um, today、uh, in Japan. Open innovation is、uh, one of the most needed one. So,、um, because there are many kinds of wall, like a closed community or a rigid organization or limited laws, etc. But I think you are now doing a very great open innovation now in the government, and which is、uh, what we call open、uh, government. So,、uh, why uh, do you uh, can you do? Uh, that kind of open government action, like、um, COVID in the in the condition of COVID nineteen. Yeah, I will、uh, share one story、uh, about COVID nineteen. That's not that much about transparency, but about trust and participation. There has been a case when a worker in an intimate drinking bar. She was diagnosed with COVID-19, but on the day one of contact tracing, she did not tell that she is a professional worker in the intimate bar. Only on the second day did she say that she works、uh, in such a place、uh, in the nightlife. Now we understand, of course, that employees in such places are sensitive to privacy, but in terms of pandemic prevention. If contact tracing doesn't work, it endangers everybody. So the government at that point has the entire social mandate to shut down such businesses, to force them to close. But we did not, because we understand such measures reinforce the stigma that a society attach to such worker already, and they will go underground. Like the prohibition era in the U.S., and that actually make the epidemic even worse. So we didn't say anything about shutdown. We said instead that, given、uh, the work that the Central Epidemic Command Center's expert had working with HIV-positive communities, they said all we need is a real contact system. As long as people could be contacted, the central government doesn't want to know who they are. And we also explained why droplet infection need to be prevented. And so it's a open invitation for the nightlife businesses to innovate in the open, in order to stay open. So they did innovate, and for example, they invented such scratch pads that are shredded. After two or four weeks, leaving only code names, single-use emails, prepaid mobile phone numbers, plastic hats with plastic shielding that、um, maintain social distancing, and when even nightclubs can join the fight in the team of 24 million, and they did open, the prevention efforts garnered a lot more trustworthiness within the society. So it's a small story about open innovation. There's some transparency in terms of the real contact system, but far more than transparency is this accountability that is voluntarily shared by the society. How can we realize the kind of social trust, and which is also the transparency? You mean? So how how can we realize、uh, that kind of、uh, trust in our society? Is there any kind of、um, solution?、Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely.、Uh, first of all, a quick, honest response is always essential, because when people understand 
that the public servants are competent and they communicate in a real time way. For example, in our CECC, it's a press conference every 24 hours for the duration of the pandemic in Taiwan. And also important is to offer sincere apology when we did something wrong. And that is, again, uh, gaining trustworthiness. One example, a quick example. So maybe you have heard of the mask availability map that we introduced around yes. early February. But maybe you did not know that in the very beginning, many pharmacists who invent their own system, like take a number in exchange for the national health card, which they tell the customer to go back and collect the map earlier uh, than uh, the close time. So maybe by 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. So they will collect the cards on 7 a.m. And then once people go off work, collect the mask at 7 p.m. while they swipe the IC card in the pharmacist site like during lunch or something. And that arrangement makes the mask map useless against such pharmacies because the real-time availability does not reflect the actual stock. So much so that the pharmacist working with take a number systems even wrote on their front door, don't trust the app. So what's important for us is that we need to apologize to those pharmacists recognizing that their inventiveness is what's worth spreading and revise our system immediately the next week, offering the opening hours. And also later on, offer the pharmacist a button that they can push and disappear from the map. And so it's better than a perfect system because it's co-creation. It reflects accurately the innovation that the pharmacist invented on the ground. So even though it took like three weeks to adjust the system, it's actually garnering even more trust with the citizens by essentially apologizing quickly and then fix it the very next day or at latest the next week. Yeah, um, the kind of immediate interaction between uh, government and the enterprise and uh, civil, civil is very important, I think. So um, the next question is about social innovation, because um, you've been trying to generate and create social innovation, for example, in the social innovation lab you created. And so what do you think about the role of social innovation in our society? Why do you support uh, that kind of social enterprise? Social innovation, simply put, is that it's everyone's business with everyone's help. So anyone can be a social innovator if you work toward a common purpose. For example, the mask map was a social innovation because it's done by Howard Wu, a civic technologist in Tainan, to solve a simple issue, which is people don't know where they should queue for masks. For example, that traditional rice cooker right there that you can see is a symbol of social innovation because there was a professor Lai Chen Yu who discovered that you can put the mask into that rice cooker, don't add water and heat it to 110 Celsius. It kills the virus, but then it cools down very quickly so it doesn't destroy the fabric. And so this is a social innovation because it's not industrial. I'm sure the rice cooker manufacturer did not have that use case in mind. It is uh, appropriating a existing technology toward a new common purpose, in this case, public health need. And it's very surprising and counterintuitive. But our Food and Drug Administration replicated the experiment and the CECC invited Professor Lai to the daily press conference to explain the theory while Minister Chen, our commander, actually cooked a surgical mask in the rice cooker and put it uh, on his face. Uh, and now, of course, we're learning from peer-reviewed journals internationally 
that this works even for N95 masks. And so that's social innovation. Imagine if all innovation have to come from manufacturers. Well, I don't think the rice cooker manufacturer would think of that. Yeah, so I think you believe in the um, people's uh, imagination and creativity uh, mm -hmm. about the social innovation. So um, please let us know more in detail what you've been trying to uh, try in uh, social innovation lab, uh, because I think mm -hmm. uh, that is a kind of uh, lab where uh, many kinds of innovation took place in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So um, this is the lab. Wow. And um, it's a park. Mm. We tore down all the walls so you can walk in and then have 40 minutes of my time if you agree to be on the record. And this public art is driven by a social entrepreneur. Um, the team is called um, a good, and they work with people with Down syndrome, with trisomy differences, uh, who look at the world like Van Gogh, uh, in very like innovative uh, ways and they draw what they see and it becomes the social innovation labs public art so the result is that when people step into the lab they become very creative for example when uh, the mayor of Prague in Czech Republic visited his team the um, city cabinet immediately get so inspired that they climbed upon this public art. It's not designed for climbing, by the way, uh, but the structure holds, so we don't have a diplomatic incident. But uh, this is important because when people show up with new innovations, it could be a technological innovation like self-driving vehicles, but then it's made social by people looking at not just the digitization part, but also how the innovation can be governed in an inclusive way. So the last digit, the last letter is inclusion, including people who previously have no idea how self-driving vehicles work into shaping the norm of such vehicles so that they feel comfortable traveling in it and so on. And so the norm building is what's happening in the social innovation lab, and that builds effective partnerships. Also in the social innovation lab, every year we give five awards to the five teams in the presidential hackathon out of more than 200 teams, each working on one or more of the sustainable development targets and each team receive a trophy from our president that's shaped like Taiwan and with a projector. If you turn on the projector, what it does is that it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, handing you the trophy. So the trophy describes itself and the president promises whatever you did as social innovation in the past three months will become public policy nationally in the next 12 months. And so we will secure the budget, the personnel, and so on, and also make regulation adjustments if needed be to enable the presidential hackathon winning teams. And it's been three years now, so we have 15 teams working on the sustainable goals in very innovative ways, including telemedicine, including a Pokemon Go-like game that invites people to refill their photos, including this push notification on heat damage to people who could suffer from high degree of heat and so on and so forth. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very surprised to see uh, the, what is the Taiwanese innovation culture and it and how it is born from uh, that labs so um i would like to um ask you about uh, that kind of innovation culture in taiwan um so what what uh, what is the character uh, of taiwanese innovation do you think yeah it's written here actually uh, it's too small for you to see yeah. but this is uh, sustainable development goals and then with this small uh, print after it that says, and I quote, Taiwan can help. And this is, uh, I think, what's the most important thing 
in the Taiwanese innovation culture. Oh, here uh, is the emblem. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the idea, very simply put, is that we're not in this to compete. We're in this to help. And it does not matter whether our innovations get used in other countries. In fact, we encourage other countries to adapt our innovations, not because we want Taiwan to be an exporter of innovation, but because we truly believe that this helps people. And so the made in Taiwan used to mean products. Nowadays, it increasingly means services. But nowadays, and especially after COVID, it means the Taiwan model. It is a system of innovation that does not sacrifice the economy for public health, or sacrifice public health for the economy. Rather, this is about taking both and deepening the democracy underneath. Uh, and that's the Taiwan model that we're sharing. And it's with this sharing spirit that we offer our innovations. Why do you think that kind of Taiwanese innovation culture uh, was born in Taiwan? And why uh, that kind of Taiwan model uh, was born even uh, especially after COVID-19? I think um, Japan of all countries can relate because any time a disaster happens, not necessarily pandemic like in SARS in 2003, it could be like an earthquake, which Japan has plenty and Taiwan too, uh, like typhoons uh, and so on. So every time when the society recovers, the entire social sector grows a little bit by offering to help one another. Actually, the innovation uh, line from Japan came from such a disaster. And so it proves to people who ordinarily would work on industrial innovation, whenever there is a disaster, they can take whatever they learned in the industry and contribute to the society and the society encourages that. So I think it is the endless stream of typhoons and earthquakes and SARS 1.0, now 2.0, that brings the society together on this Taiwan can help model of innovation and of resilience. I'm sure that the Japanese people can see this point of view. Yeah, I um, totally agree with you and I, I love uh, that uh, Taiwanese culture, uh, which says Taiwan can help you. So, mm -hmm. which which means uh, interactive help and uh, mind. I think so. Um, uh, I would like ask to ask you uh, about uh, also um, the gen uh, the gender and innovation relationship mm -hmm. because um, in Japan sometimes gender ba gender balance uh, can be controversial in business and innovation field. So um, uh, what? Uh, how uh, can we improve this problem? Yeah, I think what's important to realize here is that it's not just about diversity. It is about intersectionality, meaning that each of us, not necessarily in gender, but is minority in some regard. Like when I learn to write, I write with my left hand. I would later learn that my father and his mother, my grandma, was all left-handed. But back in their days, they were forced to conform and learn to write with their right hand because, well, that's the right thing to do. Uh, but in my time, uh, fortunately, it only uh, continued for one year because on the second grade, I encounter personal computers. And then the mouse doesn't care whether it's left or right-handed. You can swap the left and right buttons very easily with a um, configuration. And so this shows that if people ask other people to conform, then you lose the perspective that a universal design would bring to the table. It's only if like a mouse and keyboard and smartphones that it doesn't care which handedness you are on. 
well, keyboard works better if you're in by dexterous, actually, uh, then it opens up new possibilities. I use this example to show that gender is just one aspect of many. So I personally went through two puberties. So in my mind, everyone, all the homo sapiens um, is my community. I don't have this binary thinking in my mind that only sees half of population as on my side. In other words, I'm more able to take all the sides, but it doesn't have to be gender. It could be learning a transcultural view, using a new language and so on. So try to think intersectionally, try to take all the sides. It gets easier the first few moves you make in a transcultural fashion, and then you will also be able to think the entire human community as your community. Yeah, I think you are uh, the symbol of the kind of intersectionality right now. <laughs> so um, I would like to um, ask uh, the last question from my side. And after that, uh, I will pick up some comments from Japanese viewers. So, um, so the title is where do you go next so um uh, we want to know about your uh, next vision for our future and your interest uh, for the the next uh, world so please let us know about your vision yes for taiwan every year we go up by two or three centimeters uh, the tip of Taiwan, the Yushan Mountain, or Saviya, or Pentugunung, according to different indigenous traditions, uh, grows because we're caught between the Eurasian plate on one side and the Philippine Sea plate on the other. When they bump into each other, we get earthquakes. And we learn to be resilient, not only in our buildings, but in our minds. So when the mountain grows, by two centimeter or three every year. It's a symbol of the growth of not a left wing, not a right wing, but a up wing movement that sees the common values of sustainability and inclusion to the different positions of a more socialist position or a more liberal position. Both actually care a lot about leaving the world a better place than you uh, arrive to it. So that's sustainability. And that's where we're going in the next decade. By year 2030, we will meet all the SDG targets. Yeah, very clear. And I hope uh, that uh, resilience uh, can be true uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will pick up some comments from Japanese viewers because there are a lot of comments. So um, one is in English. So, uh, could you uh, tell us uh, about the change uh, COVID-19 has made in education in Taiwan? Definitely. So, one big change is that the young people do not show off anymore. It used to be before the uh, pandemic, people would show off their status symbols, their privileges, and so on, on Instagram or other social media. That's not cool anymore. When people are suffering, it's not cool to show off. It is cool to show how you contributed, how much you care. But it's not cool to show you're of a higher social status. That really changed the education because previously, educators were working with the kind of um, bragging rights of an individual-to-individual -individual competition. But now, because that's not cool anymore, the educator need to focus on problem-solving as a group, problem-based learning, social responsibilities as capstone projects, and so on. And that's a real big change. The other change, of course, is this telecommunication facility. We never had a lockdown, but we did limit large gathering. So people learned 
to be gathering in small groups like 10 or 20 people, but connect many of those groups together into a larger virtual physical hybrid classroom. And that's going to stick with us too. Okay, so cool. And uh, maybe uh, the innovative children will be uh, born from the kind of educational revolution. So um, we got uh, a question from ah, 11 years uh, old, uh, 11 years old girl. Maybe she uh, joined uh, this event with uh, her parents, maybe. So and um, she uh, want uh, she want to uh, be able to contribute to innovation. Wow. So there are people in Japan who want to innovate. So do you think there is something that, that can be done? in cooperation maybe yeah, definitely yeah you can start your own hashtag mm -hmm. or you can join one of the existing sdg hashtags from go one to go 17 depending on what you like when we had a hashtag uh, about banning plastic straws for our national identity drink the bubble tea it was started by a pseudonymous petitioner. We only know the petitioner as, and I quote, I love elephants and elephants love me, unquote. Uh, we don't know where they're coming from. We know more than 5,000 people joined their cause very quickly. And so when we meet them face to face, well, she is barely 16 years old. And when we ask her, why are you starting such a movement? Do you like Greta Thunberg? Uh, she is like, no, it's our civics class assignment. Wow. So her civics teacher just told the class to find something and start a movement and start a petition. And that's great. We actually banned plastic straws now for indoor drinking and soon for outdoor taking out too. We now work with organic materials, carbon neutral materials. Actually, the dress that you see me wearing today is made out of the coffee bean uh, waste and recycled plastic mm. bottles 100%. Uh, and so that become fashionable mm. in Taiwan. Mm. So I think it takes a very young mind, not trapped in the linear thinking mm. of the industrial era to start a movement like that or to join a movement like that and 11 years old is just the right age. Very strong word and maybe uh, your uh, word uh, can encourage her uh, to be innovative. So we got this message. So how do you manage various and vast range of innovative ideas from citizens in Taiwan? I'm very curious about how to keep the speed and hot and uh, great idea are being chosen among those to make Taiwan better? Yeah, uh, the presidential hackathon, because it expands toward all the 17 SDGs, it's impossible for a jury, for a judging panel to be an expert in all 169 targets. So we used collective intelligence. We asked people to vote. But instead of the bad old days of one person, one vote, which is very few bits of information, we use a new invention called quadratic voting or QV. In quadratic voting, what we do is that we give everybody 99 points and they can look at all the 200 or so teams. And if they vote one vote, that costs them one point. Yeah. But if they want to vote two, that's four point. Three votes will cost you nine. Mm -hmm. So you can do the math. Given 99 points, the most you can do to support one project is just nine votes, which costs 81 points, and you still have 18 left. People don't want to squander the votes, so they find some other project maybe to vote four votes, which cost 16, so they have two left. And they will be motivated to find two other projects only to find, oh, they have a synergy. So maybe they take some of the points back and do a seven and seven and so on. The design is such that the marginal cost of each vote 
is the same as the marginal return. So there's no strategic voting. The strategic voting is just to vote as much as you truly want. And then combined, it builds much more synergy between the curated teams than any panel of judges ever could. So democracy, voting, is also a technology and it's a social innovation that you could improve too. Thank you. And we got a question about humor. So um, in Japan, uh, in Japanese society, the stump uh, is uh, is one of the um, existing uh, culture uh, because uh, we need always a stamp to uh, make confirmation in uh, in the government, in the city, in the um, uh, official uh, announcement, etc. So, but uh, in our uh, situation of COVID nineteen, it's very hard to put the stamp on directly right now. But uh, uh, our mm, our society can change uh, our this um, convention. So um, with humor, uh, what can you change uh, this um, a little bit old uh, convention to the new one? So th that uh, question is uh, coming from Japanese viewers. Yeah, uh, I love handwriting. Mm -hmm but I don't do it on paper. I do this on the <laughs> glass surface. So um, this is um, kept, but the paper, not necessarily. Mm. The stamp, you can keep it, mm. but not necessarily the seal. Mm. Or if it is the seal, it could be a multi-touch seal mm. that you can apply on a touch screen. Mm. So innovate. The idea of a seal or a stamp image being important has a psychological benefit to it. And when we redesigned the National Palace Museum ticketing experience, we find that the elderly, they love to use the stamps on the ticket as a memory, like a bookmark that they did visit and they can share it with the family. If you do a paperless version of QR code ticketing, they would not use it. But then we designed such, if they use the QR code, actually that QR code after they enter the museum, instead of queuing outside, can be redeemed into a receipt that's even more beautiful than the paper ticket. Uh. It's personalized, has a seal on it, and but it's laser printed, of course. And then the QR code they can take home. And when their grandchildren scan it, whatever they saw in the National Palace Museum becomes objects in the Animal Crossing Island that their grandchildren play. Mm -hmm. And so this is intergenerational solidarity, still through paper, but not ink anymore. It's laser printed. So think of creative combinations mm -hmm. and then it will be fun. I mean, Animal Crossing is a lot of fun. <laughs> and so connect it with something that is truly fun and will make the elders happy too. Yeah, very great idea. Thank you for that kind of great idea for us. So the time is... Uh, so um, uh, we got another question. Um, how uh, in Japan now the digitalization uh, uh, is a little bit in late, and uh, we we can't uh, we didn't uh, realize the total digitalization in our society. So um, how uh, we can uh, can we uh, create a good society with the kind of digitalization uh, in Japan? Well, it's like learning to program. The later you start, the easier it becomes. So um, <laughs> like you start late is, is just fine. Um, my point here is that it's a Japanese government's idea, actually, that if industry is at 4.0, the society is at 5.0. So digitalization is a bridge to work with the industrial automation and so on, but with the social purpose 
of assistive technology and so on. If the society 5.0 can lead the vision of industry 4.0, then you may start late, but actually you will get to the destination quicker. If you think the industry rather dictates what the society should do, then you may start early, but maybe you run into the opposite direction and the such disruptive innovations actually create chaos and negative externalities in the society. So work with the social sector, make sure that the social 5.0 vision leads the industry and the digitalization will not go wrong. Thank you for your clear um, answer. So the time is up. So thank you for uh, your joining uh, our interview and our innovation garden. And so I, I will, uh, all Japanese uh, viewers uh, can uh, maybe ha happy to see you and uh, communicate with you directly. Thank you so much, Audrey. Arigato gozaimashita and live long and prosper. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye.